Episode 1 Death of an Irish Sport This is the Five Lamps, a landmark in Dublin's north inner city, one that's even name checked in a UK number one single, the Boomtown Rats Rat Trap. I'm looking up towards North Strand, and an Olympic boxer lives there. From just yards away on my left is the home of an Olympic boxing champion. Keep going up that street and you'll see a turn to the right and the signs that take you to Croke Park. It's just ten minutes walk from the Five Lamps. Croke Park is Ireland's national stadium for Gaelic games, but 50 years ago this summer, Muhammad Ali beat Al Blue Lewis there. I'm standing at the Five Lamps and looking right towards the Keys. Walk along the docklands there and you come to the Three Arena. It's had different names over the years. It's still best known to many as the Point Depot. Bernard Dunn was crown champion of the world there. Other boxers who fought in that arena include Lennox Lewis, Tyson Fury, Steve Collins, Nassim Hamid. Within walking distance of here, there are more than 15 boxing clubs. Belfast is renowned as a boxing town, but Dublin's made its mark as a fighting city too. The great Dublin boxing families left a lasting impression. The Carruths of Drimna, the Collinses of Cabra, the Ingalls of Ringsend, the Crystals of Crumlin. Walk the streets around the five lamps in the evening and through open windows you'll hear the familiar sounds of boxing gyms, the thump of glove on pad, the whip crack of a skipping rope, hard breathing and grunts of pain and effort. You'll come on Champions Avenue too, which is so named because of the number of boxing champions that came from the area. This is boxing territory, but it's also a part of the city that's been ripped apart by drugs and by a feud involving two rival factions, one led by Daniel Kinahan and the other by Jerry Hutch. The feud dates back to the killing of Gary Hutch in Spain in September 2015 and another murder in Dublin six months later. David Byrne was shot dead at the Regency Hotel, just a few minutes' walk from here, in February 2016 at a boxing weigh-in. The reported target was Kinahan, but he escaped unscathed. The feud has claimed the lives of 18 people. Some of them had never had any involvement with crime. The Kinahan cartel carried out 16 of the murders. Jerry Hutch was extradited from Spain in September and is awaiting trial on a charge of David Byrne's murder. Daniel Kinahan lives in Dubai, where he established a base as one of the most powerful men in the sport of boxing. Seven of those killed in the feud were murdered in the streets around the Five Lamps. They were murdered in boxing country. Down the road, Daniel Kinahan would be called something very different in court. But when his name came up in the Old Bailey in October 2007, he was described as a former Dublin furniture shop owner. This was the first time that Kinahan was ever mentioned in public in a sporting sense. It was stated that Kinahan had travelled from his then home in Spain to Newmarket to confront jockey Kieran Fallon in his own home in the very early hours. It was also stated that Kinahan was part of a so-called Bet to Lose syndicate and that those involved were furious with Fallon for winning races which they expected him to throw. Yorkshire businessman Miles Rogers had phone calls intercepted, and one of those referred to Kinahan as D. Rogers said in a call that he'd met many menacing people in his life, but none in Kinahan's league. Kinahan was not one of those charged. That case ended with all five co-defendants, including Fallon, being found not guilty. These days, Kinahan is associated with professional boxing rather than horse racing. But who is he? Who is this former Dublin furniture shop owner? Here's Crime Journalist of the Year, Michael O'Toole of the Irish Daily Star. Daniel Kinnan, for me, is the most important uh, Irish criminal in the last, well, probably since John Gilligan was at his height, if that's the, the right word, in the mid early to mid 1960s. 90s leading up to the murder of Veronica Geard. Um, he is really important because he leads uh, an international cartel of drug dealers 
and drug smugglers and drug importers. And his cartel, uh, at one stage, it had assets of up to 1 billion euro. Now that has been eroded somewhat. Um, but it really is, I mean, there's no doubt that he leads the, the most important crime operation connected to Ireland that there has been in the last 30 or 40 years. He really, although Gilligan was big, uh, and then massively uh, outweighs him and outshines him, I suppose. So really he is Ireland's number one criminal and a very, very important figure in Gangland and Ireland and abroad. The last time that professional boxing enjoyed a boom time in Dublin was during Bernard Dunn's heyday. RTE, the national broadcaster, got behind him and his fights attracted huge audiences, both on television and in various arenas. One of the best Irish sporting days of the 21st century was March 21st, 2009. That was the day when a Ronan O'Gara drop goal in Cardiff earned the Ireland rugby team a first Grand Slam since 1948. O'Gara talked afterwards of the emotional impact three text messages he received on the morning of the game had on him. They came from David Humphreys, Nicky English and Barry McGuigan, his old number 10 rival, a hurling legend, one of the great Irish boxers, the Irish sporting family spurring on one of their own. We saw that in ringside in the O2 arena later on when Bernard Dunn knocked out Ricardo Cordoba to win the WBA Super Bantamweight title. Sitting close together were three Irish sporting greats from three very different sports. Shane Horgan from rugby, soccer superstar Paul McGrath, former world snooker champion Ken Doherty. Jerry Gilroy, managing director of Off the Ball, was at ringside too, and his emotional commentary was a memorable one. He feels, though, that what happened more recently has killed professional boxing in Ireland. It absolutely has. And there are a lot of great professional boxers who haven't had the opportunities that have been uh, denied them because there's no home support and there's no reason for Sky to come over and put on a show or Dazon or whoever, whatever. Or there's no real reason for the national broadcaster to invest any money in it as well. The, the one question I would ask is, who actually can do anything about it beyond the government? as in the police or the government, it's difficult for the boxing, the regulatory bodies to do anything when, you know, you've, you've got obviously the, the uh, testimony in the special criminal court where they said he was linked to the leadership of one of the largest crime gangs in Europe. And that's important, right? Uh, that, that, I think that's a kind of a seminal moment in how certainly journalists are allowed to talk about this. The difficulty of, of the story breaks down in, in in many respects, particularly for the authorities in boxing, who, let's face it, are less interested in fixing this than, you know, than anybody. They want the fights to go ahead. That's the single most important thing for them is that the fights go ahead and the biggest fighters with the biggest crowds and the biggest purses continue. So uh, even if they were interested, I don't know what they could do in a scenario like this where there is at least an arm's length remove publicly. And so it, you just end up with this kind of somebody should do something. But ultimately, it needs to be the FBI, uh, the FBI, or the CIA, or Interpol, or the guards. On a chilly, wintry morning last year, I got a phone call from a man who's well known for his time boxing, as both an amateur and a professional. He wasn't looking for anything in particular, just wanted to chat about what's happening to the sport that he's always loved. And at one stage, he said something stark. He has two sons, and his wish is that they stick with Gaelic games and never box. To him, boxing as a world is falling apart, and he thinks that's down to Daniel Kinahan. In 30 years in journalism, I've got more feedback on this story than any other. There have been a flood of emails and private messages on social media. Quite a few come from people who work in Dublin's inner city, notably teachers and Gardaí. One senior guard that told me that there are kids in the inner city schools who used to enact the Kinnahan Hutch feud at break time. That was clear at a funeral in the Liberties a few years ago. Kinnahan was in attendance and it was as if he was the Pied Piper. Queues of young lads approached him looking for selfies and to shake his hand. To them, 
Kinahan had the aura of a superstar celebrity. Boxing is Ireland's most successful international sport. More Olympic medals than in any other sport. More European and world titles at professional level than any other sport. But boxing has never been fully embraced by official Ireland. It seems that there's a kind of snobbery at play. Dave Hannigan lectures in history in New York. He writes a weekly column in the Irish Times and has written three books on boxing. Here's Hannigan's take on it. I think it was perceived as a working class sport. And it was, I don't want to use the word get wise, but I think in the media, it never got the coverage that it deserved. I think that's changed, you know, with the Katie Taylor stuff. And there's much more coverage now. I also think Ireland had a strange relationship with boxing because wasn't there a thing for a long time that Ireland, the Dublin in particular, wasn't a great place for selling out boxing matches? <laughs> you know, that they, had, they struggled to get the box office that they thought fights deserved. So it, it is an odd relationship. I mean, it's perverse to me the way, the way that um, other sports, and I, and I hate to get into this, like my sport is better than yours. It, it's a very childish thing, but but like I, I have never understood, even when I worked in, in newspapers in Dublin, the coverage that horse racing gets, for instance, which is a minority sport, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned. And it got pages and pages of newspapers and, you know, and then boxing, you know, which is, is, is again, a minority sport, but is not, I think, is more widespread than more. There's more, more casual interest in boxing than there would be in horse racing. And, and yet it was very much kind of in a corner of its own in terms of coverage. Joe Egan, a former boxer who's a friend of Kinahan, told the Irish Daily Star two years ago that there's always been an underworld in boxing. This is undoubtedly true. Plenty of shady characters have been involved in the sport over the years. The most infamous of all was Frankie Carbo, a mafia don who was involved in fixing many boxing bouts. He was dubbed the mob's unofficial commissioner for boxing. But Carbo was brought to justice. In 1961, he was sentenced to 25 years in prison on charges of conspiracy and extortion against the NBA welterweight champion, Don Jordan. Some, bizarrely, try and identify Kinahan by pointing to the likes of Carbo or Don King, who killed two men. Patrick Connor is a boxing historian who's written books in both boxing and true crime. He's heard the excuses that try and explain away boxing's dark side, and he has no time for them. It's a way to shut down the argument. That's not an advancement in the argument at all. So essentially what this is, like wording it slightly differently just to, just to illustrate how ridiculous it is and how absurd it is, you're essentially saying, hey, there's something going on here. And someone's telling you, that's happened before. What does that mean? That doesn't mean anything toward what I told you. That's not an answer. That's not a solution to deal with it. That's not even an acknowledgement that you believe it's wrong. And so I think that, that what I just said leads directly to the issue, and that especially is in boxing in particular. There's a lot of cognitive dissonance in the sense that fans and pundits and people who are involved we often know what we're watching. We know what we're involved in. We know what's going on with these fighters and inside of their skulls. It's not easy all of the time to lock that back away in your head as you're watching and as you're enjoying it. And there's some sense of recognition, I think, for a lot of people that it's, that it's icky, that it's bad. And so pushing that thought further is difficult for a lot of people. That's a, a difficult conversation to people for people to have with themselves. So it's it, when you kind of take that into consideration, you can kind of understand why that conversation doesn't get moved forward because it's only going to lead to it's only going to start shining lights in fairly dark corners where people have left them dark for a long time and prefer them to be that way. Dave Hannigan is in full agreement with Connor. Boxing's past is another country. So often, the same mantra is used by those who want to explain away the involvement of people like Kinahan in the sport. That's boxing. It's a cop-out. It's something that wouldn't be accepted in nearly all other sports. 
Hannigan feels such evasion has to be confronted. Harking back to how the fight game operated in New York 70 years ago doesn't excuse what's happening now. It absolutely does not excuse what's happening now, and, and because the whole point of history is we're supposed to learn from it. Frankie Carbo, and, and you know, you talk about sentiment and, and romance earlier, this man was killing people and destroying lives and destroying the lives and careers of boxers. Don King, you know, and that was whatever, like the 40s, the 50s, I think it was the early 60s when he was basically brought down Carbo. And then Don King comes along in the 70s and 80s, destroys lives. I mean, Jack Newfield's book, The Life and Crimes of Don King, which came out in 93 or 94, is one of the greatest nonfiction books about, uh, certainly one of the greatest books about sport, because it lays the case for what a terrible person he was, what a terrible influence he was on the sport, how much damage he was doing to it. But yet, boxing never learns. You know, like in 1994, UCLA, comes to Washington to John McCain. Senator John McCain was a huge boxing fan. And John McCain is trying to clean up boxing and regulate boxing. And, and you know, they're trying to stop the next generation from being ripped off. And But it never, you know, nothing ever sticks. And even now, obviously, the Kennehan stuff is more, more in Great Britain and Ireland. But it, you can see the exact same play. The exact same play. You know, Don King would sucker people in by giving them money up front. You give a fighter money today and he's thrilled, you know, that to me, that's just playing out again and again here. And, and to the detriment, ultimately, it's going to damage the fighters. It's damaging the sport, I think, unquestionably. But what happened before doesn't justify this. And, and the fact that criminal elements have always infected boxing doesn't make it OK. And it doesn't mean we shouldn't call it out when it's happening today. It is 10 years since a press release announced that middleweight contender Matthew Macklin was setting up a boxing management company called MGM in Marbella in Spain. It's never been made clear when exactly Kinahan got involved, but he soon started to describe himself as general manager of MGM and, in July 2014, was pictured having lunch with Macklin and the boxing promoter Eddie Hearn in Spain. A month later... MGM made front page headlines after boxer Jamie Moore was shot outside its gym in Spain. That November, Macklin was knocked out by Jorge Sebastian Highland in a WBC title eliminator in the Three Arena in Dublin. Kinahan was there all through fight week. In July 2015, MGM, which would eventually change their name to MTK Global, decided to have their first card in Dublin in connection with Frank Warren. Kinahan was photographed inside the ring that night. Five months later, there was a small hall show in the Red Cow in Dublin, and an apparent assassination attempt on Kinahan was reported. Then, on February 5th, 2016, four attackers opened fire at the weigh-in for a fight at the Regency Hotel. Irish boxing would never be the same again. It led to a situation where Dublin is the only major European capital that is not allowed to host a major boxing event. The Gardaí won't give permission due to security concerns. Neil Richmond, a Fine Gael TD, describes himself as a boxing fan, and he's one of the only politicians to have spoken out consistently against Kinahan's involvement in boxing. He feels his presence in the sport has hurt the sport greatly. Oh, massively damaging. We haven't had a high-level professional bout here since the Regency. The reason we don't have professional boxing in this country, and this is a boxing country, we have a really proud history of it at amateur and professional level, um, is because of Daniel Kinnan. And it's because of other criminals like Daniel Kinnan who have plagued on communities where boxing is traditionally strong. And for there's brilliant examples like Kelly Harrington and people like that who've come out of inner city Dublin or areas that politicians like me would maybe described as socio-economically disadvantaged or deprived but there's dozens dozens more who haven't come out who have been um, lured into a life of crime either as a runner or whatever else at a very young age for cartels like the Kinnan group the one thing I will say about John O'Driscoll and the Kinnan cartel is that the efforts of Angarda Shiokana is tearing apart that cartel 
and that's very clear to see with the amount of members of the cartel that have been imprisoned, that are facing charges, um, and look, you only see the amount of drug seizures large over the last two years during the pandemic. It's huge. Um, I think it's either 40 to 60 individuals in prison in Ireland and the UK directly tied to the Kinahan cartel. Their operations are being smashed on a daily basis, which is great, but it's still a huge effort then to repair the massive damage that has been caused, particularly in Dublin. We're, take, we're talking parts of inner city Dublin and the Liberties in Dublin 8, where the cartel is very strong, where they preyed on boxing clubs and boxing communities where they used other angles to, as I said, recruit people, be it you know, as muscle, be it as drivers um, and everything else, and preying on vulnerable young people to get involved in their illicit activities. It's nearly two years since Daniel Kinahan was pushed firmly into the spotlight. Just after lunchtime on June 9th, 2020, Tyson Fury uploaded a video onto his Instagram account. In that clip, he announced that a deal had been agreed to fight Anthony Joshua. It would be one of the most lucrative fights of all time. It hasn't happened yet. And Fury made it clear that it would happen due to one man. Thanks to Dan, he announced. Dan is Daniel Kinahan. Fury's announcement meant that there was some focus on Kinahan in the sports media for a while. That was the case after a BBC Panorama investigation into Kinahan and MTK Global in February of last year too. But most journalists, if they covered the story at all, quickly moved on. Most of the heavy lifting has been done by crime journalists in Ireland, rather than the sports media anywhere. One of the few journalists outside of Ireland to have tackled the Kinahan story is David Claubert of the German newspaper Frankfurter Allemeine Zeitung. My, my focus as a journalist is on organized crime. I'm not a, a boxing or a sports journalist like you. So, so my, my starting point actually was an investigation about Rido Antachi, who is allegedly one of the, the most important and most brutal drug traffickers in, in Europe. Um, I was covering his case because yeah, it's a case that shows in a very, very frightening and, and shocking way what happens if um, organized crime gets gets out of control. How how brutal international drug trafficking actually is. Because um, Tachi, since uh, March, I think this year, he has been on trial in, in Amsterdam, accused of six murders, various murder attempts, and and he. Is still a suspect in in other cases, including the killing of the the brother and the lawyer of a crown witness who has been testifying against him. And there are also indications that Tachi himself, or or at least his uh, network, is involved in the killing of journalist journalist Peter R. De Vries in in July this year. A very shocking case. It was in this context that um, I I heard about Daniel Kinahan for the first time. I, I read his name, for example, in in Dutch uh, court documents because the police there found pictures and videos of Kinahin in Dubai together with a guy called Rico de Chilen, who was an important partner of Ridwan Tachi in the cocaine business. And also on the pictures was Rafael Imperiale, who is among the 10 most wanted criminals by, by the Italian authorities because he is uh, or was a very important cocaine broker, um, especially for the, the Camorra, the, the mafia from Naples and Campania. So during my investigation, I saw all those uh, alleged or convicted drug traffickers from Europe hanging around together in Dubai. And there were also decrypted messages that showed that they were probably doing business together, that they were joining forces and... Yeah, and then I read about the role of Daniel Kinahan in boxing, about the influence he he has in the sport and the business, and it was like, wow, how can this be true? There has always been a fascination with boxing stories. Boxing has inspired writers of the caliber of Norman Mailer, Ernest Hemingway, Joyce Carl Oates, Jack London, Gay Talisi, it's led to films of outstanding quality, including Rage and Bull, The Harder They Fall, 
On the Waterfront and Fat City. Two of Bob Dylan's greatest songs are about boxers, The Hurricane and Who Killed Davy Moore. When Muhammad Ali took on Joe Fraser for the first time, the buzz was so great that Frank Sinatra was Life magazine's ringside photographer. Ross Whittaker is an award-winning filmmaker who's covered all types of subjects, but he keeps coming back to boxing. He's made three boxing documentaries, including the groundbreaking saviors about an inner-city Dublin gym. Being around boxing people has made Whittaker realise the fine line that many walk. What I, what I would have observed in, I suppose, saviors and other boxing clubs and stories that I've heard around the sport is that it's a very fine line for young men and, and now women more and more that it's very easy to fall off the wagon. I mean, you're, you're talking about boxing clubs that are often in kind of marginalised areas where there's a huge amount of difficulties for the people living in those areas, whether it's, you know, I suppose criminality in, in some cases, um, drugs in some cases, or even just the pressure, the mental pressure of growing up somewhere and, and having a, doubts about your future you know it's, it's not people from south county dublin do you know they 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 their natural path in life is if they go to a good school if they go on to university they just see that as their path whereas if you're growing up in a more marginalized area you, you don't necessarily see a path and i think those you know boxing clubs give you something to hold on to but it's very easy to fall out of that you know because i just think you know i've observed young boxers just really struggle with the mental side of life you know that it's it, it's very easy to kind of not go training and to start i suppose to be drawn in by temptations outside of the gym to be to feel that you're banging your head off a brick wall in terms of the progress of your life so i think boxing clubs offer people a reprieve from that but it's still very very difficult for young people in in a lot of these communities to stay on the wagon and, and keep with it when they see other people around them involved in in things you know that are within those communities i suppose like you know there, there have been drug obviously we're all aware of drug issues in inner city communities and so on so i just think it's it is side by side and, and it's very very difficult for the young people there to stay on the straight and narrow and to um like bo boxing is just one small thing in their lives and if if they can stick with it it'll help them immeasurably but there's a lot of other stuff going on in those communities back in march michael conlon took on lee wood for the regular wba world featherweight title belt conlon took bronze for ireland at the 2012 olympics and was rte's sports person of the year in 2015 after becoming a world champion at amateur level that year. He was a hugely popular figure in Ireland, but there was very little coverage of Conlon's fight in the Irish media beforehand. Why was that? Because of links between both fighters and their trainers, both in the past and present, to Kinahan and to MTK Global. It became clear that so many in Ireland have now turned their backs on the sport. There's only one man to blame. There is a pattern when it comes to the biggest stories in sport. It involves circling the wagons and hitting out at those who are asking the questions. It also involves an effort by some to skirt around necessary questions or to never ask them at all. To Dave Hannigan, the Kinahan story is one of the biggest in sport and he feels more should recognise that fact. It should absolutely be bigger because it, it's a cancer at the heart of a sport. Like it's a, it's a cancer at the heart of a sport that's eating away the sport. And, and, you know, it's like if you were diagnosed with cancer and you said, I'm just going to ignore it. I'll be fine. I'm just going to ignore it. I'm not going to deal with it. And that's the attitude. In sports journalism, there is always a tendency for the people who cover the sport to turn a blind eye. Uh, tennis, international tennis for years. The journalists have covered that in, a, in what I would say is a disgraceful way, right? Ignoring all allegations of, of drug abuse and stuff like that. Cycling. I, I moved to America at the heart of the, or in, in the prime of the Lance Armstrong years. The, the major American media organizations utterly disgraced themselves. The elephant was standing right there and they ignored the Lance Armstrong thing because it was, it made commercial sense to promote the story that was there. So I think in sports journalism, 
we have a tendency to be fans first at times, and that that blinds us to the fact we have a job. One thing that struck me about the Abramovich thing is how many matches did you watch in the last 16, 17 years where the producer of the TV production cut to the stand to show us the smiling Abramovich applauding and you know celebrating Chelsea won and he's thrilled and look at him and he's a happy benevolent owner. That's complicit. Like that that's been complicit in this whole thing all along, you know. So there, there's a lot of evidence of this that sports journalists don't take the hard part of the job seriously. People don't like the hard part of the job, which is exposing exposing the bad stuff. And there's nothing worse than this. I mean, if I have to read once more about Tyson Fury's battle with drugs and how he's an example to everybody about how you defeat drugs, and you're like, how many lives have been destroyed by Kinnan and drugs in Dublin and elsewhere? And, and, you know, but we still peddle and, and you know, British boxer, boxing writers peddle this and it's just disgraceful. In episode two of Shadow Boxing, we look at why boxing matters so much to Ireland and Irish life. Often it comes down to family and family connections. What has Daniel Kinahan done to those enduring relationships? Shadow Boxing is presented and written by Kieran Cunningham and produced by Kieran Bradley. Thanks to all the contributors and to Chris Heaney for additional music.